Hey Reluctant Preppers, you could have been watching this video the moment it came out. By going to healingyourself.life and subscribing to our new sister channel, Healing Yourself. See you there! Healingyourself.life provides information for awareness, educational, and support purposes only and does not diagnose or prescribe treatment for any medical condition. Viewers are encouraged to do their own due diligence and consult with their own medical caregivers before making personal treatment decisions. Welcome back to HealingYourself.Life. We are back with our off-grid medical doctor, Jay Nielsen, MD, a family practice doctor in Northwest Ohio and the owner of a survival compound in Haiti, which has been doing some major upgrades recently. We're here to talk about what's truly a crisis for uh, Americans who are using medical care and the financial uh, divot that it takes out of their lives. It's truly causing We've had people who have to go back to work after retiring because they can no longer afford the, co the COBRA cost. We've had, uh, my, in my own experience, we'll talk about a 10 times difference increase in prices between the different providers. So can you talk to us about the current debate around single payer and why it may be more of a nightmare than a dream come true? Yep, uh, I will get there. It's on my list. I have a plan today for making sure we cover where we are, where we could go, what we could do to fix it, and what you as a consumer can do to stay out of the system and still get good health care. I want to cover all of that. Um, and you mentioned the fact that my, I have 12 years working on my prepper site, and I'm pretty much done. Two million bucks, and I'm really pleased. Um, also, I always run into something in the news that I've got to bring up first. This was on the drudge today, okay? And they've figured out that all these beached whales huh. are all from EMF. And it's screwing up their sonar systems and they're all beaching themselves because of those ELF submarine guiding systems and radar towers and they're just beaching themselves because they're completely disoriented. And so they're capable of killing whales that are living hundreds of feet underneath the sea with water protecting them. Wi-Fi doesn't travel through water very well or any of that stuff, and yet it's, it's okay for us. <clears throat> this is our basic problem in America. We are the 17th least healthy out of the 17 top industrialized nations in the world. We have the most expensive healthcare in the world by a lot, and we're getting nothing for our dollar, okay? Um, if you start saying, well, how could we fix this? One of the things I would suggest you do is go up on the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons site. This is the organization that is against the AMA and represents docs. And when I opted out of Medicare, they taught me how to do that at no charge. They basically help docs stay in private practice. They're very much interested in returning to good health care. And, and this is off of their website um, under options and they kind of start out with the Oath of Hippocrates and they go, if we're going to reform this, we've got to repeal Obamacare, promote private practice medicine, eliminate third party payments, uh, get rid of block Medicaid, replace price controls with competition, reform the mm -hmm. tax code, uh, lower barriers to life-saving treatments, uh, remove barriers to market entry. A naturopath should get a, be paid if people think that's their value or an acupuncturist. Get rid of the barriers. <coughs> um, reduce liability. It's in cost, uh, increasing cost to all of the doctors. Um, make due process with state medical boards fair. Um, and <coughs> get rid of this thing where Medicare, <coughs> excuse me, decides what's covered. And, th and, that, and I thought, well, that's a pretty good summary of what's screwed up. So I thought I'd start there. Um, here's one of our problems that's wrong. You can go up on a website, propublica.com, and you can look up your doctor and find out how many kickbacks he had. Right now they're doing 2017. Okay, they're always behind. It takes them a long time to collect this stuff. I'm $310, and it makes me mad because these reps show up with a pizza, and I tell them I don't want it, and then they put me down that I ate the pizza, and I've, they, I've rejected $310 in pizza and donuts. 
last year. Um, so it's not completely accurate. There are docs up there that won't participate in kickbacks, and they still say they do it. Um, but, you know, this guy had $26,000 in kickbacks. The, the big players, the guys that are doing things like buying um, pacemakers, they can get up into half a million dollars a year. Um, here is the basic problem with what's wrong in America. This is my bill for something that happened to me last year. Okay, And at the bottom, it says that the hospital wanted, Med, wanted MedMutual, my insurance company, to pay $234. That's what they thought was a fair bill. And Medicare allowed $99.77, so 40%. And then they got Humana to pay 79 of it, and Medicare paid 20 out of a $234 bill. They paid 10 cents on the dollar. So we're talking about Medicare for all. So you're not going to have that cost shifting. You're not going to have anybody coming in and saying, oh, I'll pay Medicare's bill because Medicare won't pay it. It's going to be all Medicare. And so Medicare is going bankrupt right now. And they're only paying 10 cents on the dollar. What happens when they have to pay 100 cents on the dollar? I don't get Medicare for all. I was listening today on one of the networks to that guy that's running think it from um, Starbucks? Starbucks that's ta Schultz that's talking about running independent and I haven't got my finger on his pulse yet but he's doing the, the Ross Perot thing he's going to tell us the truth and the truth I, I love light illuminate things he is going to sit there and he just says you know the Democrats are socialists the Republicans are all corrupt the government doesn't work at all don't trust anybody we need to start all over again Okay, this is all broken. That's a good message. I like it. I don't know whether or not I want him for president. He's going to he's probably going to end up causing an electoral college not to have a majority, which means that the House of Representatives gets to pick the Democratic candidate of their choice. But I'm I always keep saying, you know, I think the best thing we can do is let the Democrats have the thing for a while. They just keep running in the ground. You know, eventually we'll figure it out. But I'm not waiting for the Republicans to fix it. We, I have a lot of stuff I want to show you very quickly, oh, that, that's out of sequence, about alternatives, okay? This is really the right alternative to health care, and this is the high deductible or catastrophic health insurance policy, okay? And the advantage of a high deductibility policy where you don't let anybody insure their first eight or $10,000 is almost all health care in America goes to cash. And the minute we go to cash, we get competition. And we'll show you what competition does to the cost of health care. Because I live in that world. I, it's what I've done for the last 40 years is cash care. And I know exactly what it costs. And so everybody, the Republicans and Democrats, they all want to keep their insurance companies. They want the government to do it because they all those layers, they all get to keep 30% of everything they make. Everybody says, oh, my insurance company is trying to save money. No. I go, no, they aren't. They're trying to spend as much money as they can because they get to keep a third of it. That's just plain facts. They don't, they don't want to save money. That's the reason why they won't pay my office visit, but they'll pay a million dollar liver transplant mm -hmm. because it only costs them 25 bucks to build a liver transplant and they get to keep $333,000. But when they pay me $79 for an office visit, it still costs them $29 to bill it and they eat up their third. That's, that's how the healthcare works. So, do we have a model for the best healthcare in the world today? Who is doing the best job out there? Okay, that's the question. And everybody argues about that. I haven't argued about it for years. The jury's in as far as I'm concerned. No, it's not Cuba. Okay, you know, uh, no, it isn't the Dominican Republic, and it sure as heck isn't the United States. It's the French. They have the lowest morbidity and mortality in the world. They're the best quality health care. They're number 17 on the list of 17 in cost. We're the opposite. We're 17th in quality and first in cost. They're first in quality, 17th in cost, and they have the highest physician approval of their own system. Their physicians and providers like what they're doing. Hmm. America's last. Okay. Switzerland's up there doing a nice job. UK's hanging in the middle with their socialized medicine thing because they kind of split private practice with uh, socialism. Um, and so the reason that the French healthcare system worked 
is what they did is they eliminated a, a lot of their overhead. If this is the chart for running the federal government in France to do health care, if you did this to Obamacare, there'd be like 700 of these blue boxes. Okay, and the lines would cross each other and it would be a nightmare. They really simplified government involvement. Basically, they run health care. We assume in America that every doctor, every hospital, every insurance company is completely criminal and stealing everything they can. So every case needs to be investigated and prosecuted to catch you and recover the funds. And we call that paying people back and rebates and whatever, you, you know, that whole thing where I get paid and a year later they come back and say we've decided we shouldn't have paid you that, send some of the money back. And sometimes they do that to a whole block of patients. I had one year that, that my partner had to pay back $300,000 and it just about put him out of practice. And so they're not doing that. They're doing the same thing that you're doing at Kroger's or Napa. They assume that if you see me as a doctor and I tell the government, I saw this guy for a level four visit, send me my 59 bucks, they go, you did it. Here's your 59 bucks. They don't investigate each one. They don't fight over each one. What they do is they watch the processing pattern and they see people who are outliers and then they look at the outliers and they go, this guy's not legit. But if you're kind of doing the same amount of business as everybody else, nobody's in prosecuting Kroger's over a carton of milk. They're going, nobody complained, pay the bill. Okay, The French have gone to that. They're, they're not doing a whole bunch of administrative oversight. The big thing that they did, two really, really big things that they did, is they went to free market. And so they went out to all the MRI scanners and they said, uh, everybody put in a bid for what they can do an MRI for. It came back to be $343 for an MRI without contrast, which you'll see that's ironic later when I get into my cash MRIs. And, um, and so they said, okay, that's what the government pays for an MRI. So if you want to go to some place that charges $422, okay, you're going to have to get your money out. But you can get free health care if you go to the place with the lowest bid. And then the market just automatically fluctuates through the ability of that one company to provide enough service. They go, wow, we're so busy, we can't do that. Their prices go up, payment to everybody goes up, or competition goes down. But it's free market, mm -hmm. there's competition. And so we're paying $6,000 for an MRI that you're getting for 343 bucks in Paris, mm -hmm. okay? They will not allow oncologists to have the government pay for any chemotherapy that doesn't work at least 20% of the time. That got rid of 80% of their chemo. 80% of their chemo didn't work 20% of the time. Wow. Okay, They have eliminated Chinese drugs because they know it causes more healthcare problems than it helps because there's so many counterfeits and so much crap. We just watched the Velsartan controversy with all the poisons in the Valsartan. And, um, and they're pretty much not allowing any American drugs because the American drugs are all inflated in price. Mm -hmm. And in having done that, they pretty much have gotten control of their health care costs and to the point where the doctors are happy. Their general consultation first visit has a copay of $7.30. Their psychiatry consultation has a $12 copay. A root canal has a $30 copay. A tooth cleaning has a $9 copay. Um, you know, it's pretty affordable. Mm -hmm. And there are copays because people need to have skin in the game. Their inpatient hospital one day is $22 copay. Their doctor visits $1.20. An ambulance is two dollars and forty cents, and they're doing that. They have multiple places they're getting that revenue. One of the places they're getting about ten percent of the revenue is from taxing alcohol and cigarettes, mm. and they're doing that thing I've always recommended. Where why don't you go tax the things that cause disease and let the market work that out? Canada figured that out twenty years ago, and they said we're going to tax cigarettes until we get enough money out of them to pay for all the emphysema and cancer. And cigarettes for a while were getting up 
to like 10, 12 bucks a pack. And then everybody quit because they got too expensive and cigarettes settled in for about 30% more than America. But they just, you know, if you do that, the market will correct the problem. If we took the cost of alcohol in America and taxed it at a rate that paid for all the automobile accidents, head trauma, alcohol rehab centers, domestic violence, and everything, a bottle of scotch would probably be four or five hundred bucks. I mean, it, it, you can't even do the math. You know, you could never get high enough. You'd, you'd virtually be back in prohibition. Okay. Um, so here is total health expenditures. This chart's a little old, but this is 2010, and that's the United States over there. And you're watching. Um, 1995, 2000, 2005, and 2007. So you're seeing the growth in healthcare for each one of these markets. They're cost. all growing. This is the cost. Expenditure, okay. Expenditures, okay. Okay, so everybody says, oh, rich doctors, okay? Like, deal with that one, okay? 10 years ago, doctors were 8% of all expenditures in the United States, even though we're basically doing all the work. Everybody Meaning else's. Of medical expenditures? Total. Nationwide, 8% of all the money that is spent in healthcare actually goes to a doctor in for anything. Healthcare, okay. In healthcare. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, and so I'll put this up so if anybody wants to screen capture it because it's a really, really neat chart. 6% um, of physician practice owners' income decreased. Uh, Physician practice owners' income decreased by 6% between 2007 and 2011-2012. Here's another year, down 5%. Okay. Overall, my income has gone down in dollars 27% since I started practice in 1981. That's not adjusted anything, nothing. When I was in practice in 1981, I was making $156,000 a year. I'm now making 140. Okay. Is anybody else doing that? Nobody else is doing that. Everybody else has got cost of living increases and they're going up. Mm -hmm. And we have continually, doctors have been dropping for a long, long time. And because of that, we used to be considered upper class and now we're middle class, okay? Physicians spend 40,000 hours training and more than $300,000 on their education, yet the amount of money they earn per hour is only a few dollars more than a high school teacher. On average, non-primary care doctors earn $116,000 more than primary care. During the three to seven years of medical residency, physicians in training who abide by the maximum 80-hour work week, I was closer to 110, mandated by the Joint Commission, make about $11 an hour before taxes. I made $3.81, but then again, it was 1978, okay? Some residents work more than 100 hours per week, and they're even lower, and you know, I agree with that number. Primary care physicians earn barely more annually than the amount they accumulated in debt from medical school. Period. Okay. Family physicians spend one fifth of their time performing activities outside of the office that are not reimbursed. Uh, that's 20%. I'm probably 30, I would guess. Volume, not quality, determines pay. This is what happened when doctors joined hospitals and left private practice. I spend 30 minutes with every patient that I see, unless they intentionally come in for like a script refill for 15 minutes. But I spend more time doing a script refill than most doctors do working up your brain tumor. You know. Now, so we got the doctors are just disappearing. They're get, there are fewer and fewer doctors every year. But here's a chart of the growth of administrators in medicine. Uh, the physicians is that little dark area way down at the bottom of the chart. I see barely yep, going at all. Right. The physicians are on there, and they're that little bottom wedge right there. That's the growth in physicians, and this is the growth in administrative staff. When, when I was a young physician, and you'd go into a small hospital, 40, 50 beds, the entire administration was an administrator and a secretary. You walk into that same hospital today, and there may be 10, 12, 15 people. 
And that's just little hospitals. Oh my gosh, you get into the big hospitals and they've got entire, well. Additional wings, yeah. Yeah, additional wings, right, okay. Here's one of our problems, okay, physician compensation, okay. And way down there at the bottom is pediatrics and family medicine. Okay, now these numbers look pretty nice. Hey, I'd take that 207000 for family practice. Of course, I had to join the hospital and sell my soul and see seven people an hour and do all that thing. In private practice, that number's still sitting down at 130. Okay, here's the one. We've talked about this before. I think we even used this chart. 50% of all doctors in the United States today are over 55. Now, that used to not make any difference. My dad practiced until he was 84. So 65 was no number to him. Yeah, the last 15 years he slowed down just like I'm slowing down. But he still saw a lot of patients. And so now everybody's joined the hospital. Well, everybody's vested at 65. They all hate their job. And so 65, they're out. And so we've lost 15 to 20 years of productivity from all our primary care docs. Okay. And so we've got all these docs that entered medicine with me or 10 or 20 years behind me and thought they would practice until they're 75 to 80. Now they all hate their jobs and they're all getting out at 65. So as a result, this chart's actually low at 130,000. The latest results are now 217,000 doctors less than we have today. In 10 more years, we're going to have a loss of almost a quarter of a million doctors. We're going to be going up. We're not going to go up. We're going to go down. But don't worry, we got all those nurse practitioners. They'll take care of that for us, right? Match day. Match day is the day when all of the uh, medical students decide what field they're going into. Percent filled compared to available slots family medicine has dropped to 44% full. I think I mentioned here one time on one of our talks that when I came to my town in 1972 to start medical school, there were six family practice residencies in a town of a half a million people. Each one of them had six residents in each year, three years, and we were putting out 36 family practice residents, 65% of which stayed in our area, northwestern this state, southern and northern state, but stayed locally years and years and years. And July 1st, our last family practice residency closed and we have none. Huh. We have no effort to make any family doctors here at all. If we get them, it's because we paid them a lot of money to come from Area 51 or Minnesota or whatever, and that's a whole bidding war, and the bidding war just creates more and more expenses. And nobody's here because they want to be near their mother-in-law. Okay? Change subjects. Electronic medical records. Do they work? I'm on electronic medical record. I've been on the same one for 25 years and it's pretty cool. It's called Soapware. It's out of business and I'm on version 4 and they were on version 11 when they quit. And that's why I can't leave Windows XP. Okay? And all it is is a macro editor. You know, I write MAC and hit spacebar and it writes macro bid and saves me a lot of time. And I've been doing it now for 25 years and I can just sit there and write a chart. But everything that I macro edit, I wrote and I intended to say that to that patient at that time, so it's a part of their record. But I get records from emergency rooms now, and they only came in because they had a one centimeter laceration and got three stitches, and the stitches are to come out in eight days. That's the only information I need, and they got a tennis shot. That's the information I need from the chart. And the record is 27 pages yeah. long, single space, and the three pieces of information I need are on three different pages and buried in a 10-point font, but I know whether or not they have a gun at home. Well, I don't know that. I know they were asked. I know whether or not anybody beat them up. Do they have any domestic violence? Um, I know all kinds of things that the government is going to give you an extra two and a half bucks if you ask that question. And the hospitals have perfected this process of putting all of this stuff down on paper. None of it usually happened. Nobody really asked the question. They just say it did. And then they get more money 
than I get in practice because I didn't play the game. Electronic health records are a nightmare. The VA had a really interesting system where when you wanted to prescribe, you'd slide a scroll bar down and these little three millimeter wide bars would show up. One would be green, one would be white, one would be green so you could see them. So my macro bid for a urinary tract infection, I'd hit it. And it would write macro bid. Well, no, it wouldn't. It might write the next thing up or the next thing down. Well, when I write it, I watch it be typed. But you didn't get to see what you wrote. And 15% of all the prescriptions the VA was writing were for the wrong thing. And they had to go change their entire electronic medical record because it was screwed up. And so you have all these EMRs. They're gen it's so easy to generate stuff. But it's not because you have a treatment plan and a differential diagnosis. It's because your manager of your hospital group is back at you going, hey, you only did three MRIs and you contracted you'd do seven a month. By Friday at five o'clock, you need to write four MRIs. And so the guy walks in and goes, okay, let's just add a neck MRI to this one. Let's do it. Yeah, it's a mess. Okay. Health records don't work. Drugs. Wow. We could just do a whole show on this. Okay. First of all, you we watch Skakel do that thing where he bought injectable progesterone mm. that my custom compounding pharmacist used to make for Medicaid for like 22 bucks and he took it to 2300 because he bought the patent mm. and then my custom compounding pharmacist couldn't make it anymore because it was illegal because he bought the patent on a 50 year old drug and then he's charging Medicaid $2300 and for some reason they decided it wasn't good for him to do that and he went to prison okay but everybody else who's doing it is getting real rich. And one of the things that's driving up our drug prices is Part D Medicare. Because Part D Medicare, when they went to the pharmaceutical industry and said, you guys are going to have to bring your prices down, the pharmaceutical industry said, you've got to give us a monopoly. And so I used to have like five different companies that made vitamin B12. Hmm. Now only American Standard makes it. So American Standard has like 30 injectable products that they make and they don't make them all every day because it's easier to pour everything into a 55,000 gallon vat and do the chemistry and set up the machine and say there's all the B12 for the next six months. Now we're going to go over and we're going to do something else. Thiamine. Okay. Well, if they miscalculate need, they can't get back to it till they get through their manufacturing cycle. When Plan D came in, I was paying $2.36 for 15 2cc doses of vitamin B12. Okay? And I'm now paying $128, up from $2. And that's Part D Medicare. That's what Part D Medicare does. So we just need Medicare for all. Medicare for all ought to solve it. Ought to be good. Okay? If you want to really see an interesting YouTube, put in Pharmacy Benefit Manager, okay, and then look for that YouTube from that pharmacist in New York who isn't a pharmacist anymore, and you'll find it because it had like two trillion hits and there won't be any other thing that's got a lot of hits. This guy made national news, okay? Every pharmacist has to sign an agreement that he will never tell any of his clients about pharmacy benefit managers. If he does, they can sue him and take his license. And this guy took a bullet for all of us and finally explained to the world what pharmacy benefit managers are. They're a big loop to increase the profit for the insurance industry. And this is Wikipedia's definition. We'll start with the statement, the neutrality of this article is disputed relevant discussion may be found on the talk page. Okay, In the United States, a pharmacy benefit manager, PBM, is a third-party administrator of prescription drug programs for commercial health plans, self-insured employer plans, Medicare Part D, and the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. And they are responsible for developing, maintaining the formulary, contracting the pharmacies, negotiating discounts and rebates with drug manufacturers, processing and paying prescription drug claims. That was very generous. They're 
in the business of making sure that all drugs are expensive as possible and everybody who's in the mill making them expensive gets a kickback. And we're not allowed to know that they exist because if we knew they existed, we would have Nuremberg war crime trials and we would put them all in prison because they're all criminals. If I could interrupt there, we've, we've interviewed a few guests on our show uh, who have talked about if you, if something doesn't pass the smell test, if it doesn't pass the gut check, if you can look at the outside and you can say, I can see from the outside that there's a huge gap here in logic or in numbers, it doesn't add up, it doesn't make business sense from the outside. I'll just give a quick personal anecdote is that I recently got treated with an IV for uh, low iron in the blood. I've typically gone to a local clinic and they do it. Uh, my Their price that, that they want to charge for that is about $1,300 and the insurance company says, no, it's only worth $576. I, I mistakenly went to a different provider and was unable, they, would they wouldn't tell me the price ahead of time. I tried for two days. I love that. I yeah, tried for right. two days, talked to the people who schedule it, talked to the practice manager, and when I got the bill within a week after, the, suddenly they figured out right after I got it how much it was going to cost. And instead of 1300 they asked the insurance, 10500 The insurance said, no, it's not worth it. It's the same insurance company and the same medication. Instead of saying the first provider, oh, it's worth 576 they told these people, we're only paying 4500 And you look at that and you go, what business would have a contracted, negotiated price for the same exact procedure and the same exact medicine, the same brand name, everything was the same, and, and tell one provider, it's only worth five seventy six until they want it. It's worth four and a half thousand, and then they they have the gall to put on the thing. We saved you five thousand dollars. Exactly. But no. And what? and, so and that happened because in your second case they had a pharmacy pharmacy benefits manager working on the case, and his job was to increase your charges, and yeah. meanwhile they probably only paid a hundred dollars for the drug. Right. And, and and they probably only gave the nurse and the doctor who administered it maybe two hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and everything else. I do people that all the time. I watch, uh, my boys are both interventionalist cardiologists, and they go in and they do a cardiac cath and put a stent in your heart. And come on, these are some of the most technically difficult procedures in the world. Okay, and these boys are the best there is. And they go in and they spend an hour, an hour and a half. Some caths can get really ugly and go three hours. And the hospital gets 15000 20000 bucks, and they get $231. How is that right? Everything is designed to go to the American Hospital Association dues paying members and the American Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association dues paying members. Those two organizations run our health care. Okay? And after that, everybody else is powerless. Doctors are powerless. Okay, let's fix some of this. That, that's there nothing but bad news in that. Okay? Now let's go get some good news out. Okay. So you need um, to save money on your meds, okay? I have been using this company for a long time. Th this is the company that I use to get my meds, and Donegan uses this as well. This is phar globalpharmacyplus.com, okay? This is a Canadian pharmacy out of Vancouver, but it's very important to recognize that this is a European pharmacy. Whereas the ones you see in Canada, they're Chinese pharmacies or Indian pharmacies. They're a whole different product, you know. And sometimes these people now are to stay competitive or starting to show some Singapore, et cetera. But you never see Chinese or Indian crap from them. And I want to show you an example of what this can do for you. And I tell people you should take all of your meds, no matter what you're paying, get your slip out. Because a lot of times you can get a higher quality med for less than your copay. Mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. And here's an example. This is the Combavent inhaler. This is not this is not just Provental, this is Provental and Etropropium. Okay? This inhaler at your local pharmacy is billing out at three hundred and thirty to five hundred dollars. Twenty bucks. Now what's the copay on a five hundred dollar product at the pharmacy? It's going to be more than 20 bucks, mm -hmm. okay? And so all you do is you go up to this, this is the main page, and you type in any drug, and it's pretty smart if you put in a Torvastatin or you put in Lipitor, or in this case you put in Respimat or Combavent or Itropropium, one of the ingredients, it will come up to a page of things and you can look down it and you can find the product. If you don't find it, then I'll carry it, okay? But I've got a list now 
one of my favorite stories is I had a drug that I gave adolescent girls for menstrual cramps because one half of all missed school for girls in high school is for menstrual cramps no matter what the school slip says. Okay? So it's a big deal. It's a big health problem in America. It's very disruptive to education. Okay? And this drug is just an anti-inflammatory, but it very specifically works better than all the rest of them. And you only need to take like six tablets to get through your period. Okay? And so a bottle of 50 of them last half a year, year, nine months in school, or whatever, you know, not a lot of money. And all of the time I ever prescribed it, it was $15, $20. All of a sudden, a year ago, went $2,600. Somebody bought the patent, just like Skakel bought progesterone. Somebody bought the patent and went $2,600. And I went, uh-oh. And I just forgot about Global. And one day I was up on Global and I thought, hmm, Ponstel. I typed in Ponstel, 40 bucks for like three months supply. It was incredible. My favorite gout drug, Euloric, which works better than any other gout drug by like fivefold, is $700 a month to your pharmacy, and I can get 180 days for $70. So I'm paying $13 a month, and in the United States, it's $700. Okay? And so, you know, educate yourself and go find your cash and quit asking your insurance company to do it and get the heck out of Dodge and pay cash. Okay? I found this. This came the other day with one of my cultures and it's an internal document from the hospital to calculate their profit. And they accidentally put it in my note. And it says down here that IV Cipro is $2.06 for 400 milligrams, the standard dose. Okay, try 500. Okay, this is like $500 a dose at the hospital, and it they're paying two dollars and six cents. Yeah, of that uh, sticker shock that I reported on my iron IV, nine, and you're right, 90% of that sticker price was the medication itself, was just this little IV bag of Farahim yeah. uh, iron, and that was the item that was 10 times as, as much uh, negotiated. So so come back, help me, help me understand this. Why in the world would my insurance company be willing to pay? They, they always brag about how they have the, the negotiating power of, of high numbers and that sort of thing so they can keep costs down and that <laughs> sort of thing. So why would they be willing to pay 10 times as much to one provider for the same exact material, the same brand name, everything? Well, it's really, really simple. They get one third of all the money they charge. So if every year they charge more, Premiums go up 20%. They we do. saw that under Obamacare, 20%. Yeah. You know, congratulations to Trump. He actually got him to go down a little bit, not go up 20% for the first time in eight years. But, you know, when you look at the whole thing, they want to spend as much money as possible because as it goes through, they keep a third of it. And so, and, and they own the pharmacy anyway. You know, all these insurance companies and hospitals and pharmacies are all owned by each other now. The mergers are phenomenal. You can't even pay. You you can't even figure out who owns who anymore. No, that's even true. When I was arguing about this prices with the with the second provider, the expensive provider, I realized that the people who I had been working for months to argue with, they're not even the same company. They're another outsourced company. So the medical provider said, "We can't figure. Out, we can't tell you what the price is because we only do the medical part." Right. And but the day after you get the service done, then the the billing companies yeah, sure you say, "Here's but, how we're going to get you." And they have the same name, but it's a separate company. And then and and that gets more and more entangling after that. But if you if your car started making a funny sound and you go to the mechanic and say, Hey, my car's making a funny sound, he says, Yeah, I know what the problem is. We're gonna have to change out the rotors on your brakes. You say, How much is it? Oh, I don't get into the business end of it. I only do the fixing. We'll let you know later. Do you want your car fixed or not? Yeah. And you say, I guess so. I gotta go leave town tomorrow. Yeah. So then you get the bill from the other people and they say, Well, you should have known. It's like, yeah, you should have known. Yeah, exactly. Jeepers. Um, this is an article that was in the Wall Street Journal. Okay, very interesting article. And what it said was that if we went back to the pharmacy system we had in the 1920s, where pharmacists actually made things, and you actually collected the raw powder and had the pharmacist work with you to put it in whatever form you wanted, liquid, you know, suppository, etc., um, that it would bring costs down. Well, what's the FDA in the business of? They're trying to put custom compounding pharmacists out of business. You know, I found out that Zelgans, the um, 
a product for Crohn's and um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and all of the psor psoriatic arthritis, one of those ads on TV. I found out that Zelgians, you, you see these people that they're born with a genetic disorder and they have no hair. It's called alopecia totalis or alopecia universalis. I have two patients in my practice with it. If you take that drug and you put it in an alcohol-based solution and rub it on your scalp once a day, within a month all your hair grows back. And you only need, this drug is $7,000 a month, and you only need $40 of it to make your hair grow back. Do you think those people would pay cash for that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I called up my custom compounding pharmacist and said, I got two patients, I wanna do this. And he said, the minimum order is $7,000. The company will not sell me less than $7,000 worth of it, so they're gonna keep me out of the market. He says, so I'm supposed to buy a 10-year supply for these two patients and hope they keep coming, and I'm supposed to internally bank that $7,000. He said, if you can get the two patients to put up $3,500 apiece, I'll put their name on the jar. <laughs> oh and everybody went, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. It's all rigged. Everything's rigged. Okay, surgery. This is the cost of a hip replacement in Switzerland, Spain, UK, Canada, France, Netherlands, Germany, and the United States, of course, is the big bar. Look at that. $7,000 in Switzerland and $35,000 to do a hip replacement in the United States. This is where we get the term uh, medical tourism. I'm coming. Don't get ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> Got that covered. Okay. My brother did that. Okay. This was came to me in the internet the other day, and I saved it. Um, Google needs surgery question mark questions to ask, and what they're telling you is don't ever have surgery from somebody who hasn't done fifty of something in the last year, unless nobody's done fifty, like a Whipple, and then you say, okay, I'm going to go for twenty, okay, and your morbidity and mortality from surgery from asking that one question and finding out what experience surgeons have. And if somebody says, I did one last year, run. This is a Medigo, okay? And um, this is one of the hospital systems at United Arab Emirates, okay? And you can go to Dubai and et cetera. My brother, had this really rare eye disorder where his thyroid got whacked out and his eyes bulged out and he needed this surgery where they go in and debulk the eye muscles. And the only person who did it in the Midwest was at my local massive tertiary care center. And my brother uh, has never had insurance because he made some really good investments when he was young. And he's always had money and he just pays as he goes along and he wasn't Medicare yet, so he didn't have any insurance. And so he shows up at this tertiary care center and sees this doctor and the guy says, you're gonna go blind if we don't operate within the next six months. And um, Jeff says, what's it gonna cost? And he says, honestly, I don't know. I'm not in that business. Mm -hmm. Go down to the business office and they'll tell you. So my brother goes downstairs and they say, well, we charge $70,000 for that surgery. Um, but you don't have any insurance. And he said, no. They didn't ask him if he was worth millions of dollars. Mm. They didn't do a means mm. test. Mm. They said, you don't have any insurance. 16. Okay. So my brother went home and he scheduled surgery at this tertiary center that will go unnamed. And um, somebody said, have you looked into doing that in Dubai? And so he went ahead and asked this medical system in Dubai, do you have a specialist who does this? And they said, yes, we do, okay? And so all he had to do was pay his ticket to get to New York. Once he got to New York, he got in a private jet with six other patients, and he and his wife flew to Dubai and stayed in a class five hotel room surgical suite that she stayed with him. And he got there, about two hours after he got there, his surgeon from the tertiary care center walked in. What? And he said, I got the same surgeon? He said, why didn't you tell me this? He said, well, I'm not allowed to tell you that. They'd fire me. I can't tell you I'm over here. 
He says, these people have all the best people in the world coming over here to do surgery. And the very, he says, I love it here. I says, my surgical suite is state of the art. My post-op care is superb. And he said, what was your cash price at my place? And he said, 16,000. He says, what is it here? And Jeff said, 11. Hmm. And he stayed and they came in and, and um, said, we know you're not from here. And, um, and so stay as long as you want. Just stay in your room. We'll keep bringing you meals. And if you and your wife want to go out and do some shopping in Dubai or do, take a tour or anything, go ahead. And when you're ready to go home, give us a call and we'll put you in the next jet back home. And so they stayed in Dubai for four or five days and vacationed on their health care dollars that were all cash. True cost of health care. You think those people aren't making money? About six, seven years ago, I started a website, faircareforall.com, okay? And my purpose was to get people to understand what you could do with cash health care, okay? And it didn't work with crap, okay? The only thing it did was the same thing I do today with Voucher Lab, and other than that, I basically was a referral site. I had people contact me from all over the world and say, how do I get this in San Francisco? Mm -hmm. But I didn't have anybody here asking me for it. And so after a while, it was just a bunch of work for nothing, and I gave up, okay? But let's go to lab, okay? Let's talk about lab, okay? Here is an ad. Oops, I can't, I can't do that. It's got a name on it. Sorry. Let's go to... Oh, I can't do that. That didn't black out very well. Let me keep, let me keep working here. I'm, I'm going to get this down to the point where nobody sues me, okay? <laughs> okay? And... If you want to do a screen, how did it do? Yeah, it did, okay, get a screen capture on that, mm -hmm. okay. What you're gonna see here, let's just take right at the top, CBC and differential, the basic blood Complete count. Complete blood count. Complete blood count with the differential. And at my local hospital, it's $239, and other hospitals, 178, and other outpatient service is 150. And my local physicians group, okay, is trying to undercut everybody and provide cash care, and they're 20, and I'm 12, okay? So, do you think I'm doing that out of the kindness of my heart? No, I'm doubling that puppy. It's six. Your CBC costs six bucks. Your hospital's charging you $239 for a $6 CBC. But your insurance company will tell you, we saved you $100. That's right. That. That's right. Because then you send that 239 in, they go, we're only paying 180 Okay. So now you have to look at this. Here is PSA. Okay. And that PSA at the local hospital. That's uh, men's prostate. Yeah, prostate sur surface antigen, $254. And my local medical group there was 45 and I'm 28 Okay. And I'm telling you. My lab's the best lab in my entire area. This is the best lab that I'm working with. And so you go, why does my lab do this for me? Well, what they want me to do is they want me to go ahead and bill insurance for it, take it back up to the 239 bucks. And boy, I make a lot of money. As a private clinician, I can't do that. But if I can get into a group, Okay, and play all the paperwork and everything, I can make more money selling lab to my patients than I can make practice in medicine. That's why it exists. What I'm doing is, we call it a voucher program. What you do is you bring your prescription in, hand it to my girl at the front desk, and she turn, says, okay, all this lab is going to cost you 150 bucks, which means it would have cost you 2500 if you handed it into your insurance. And then you pay me on your credit card so that I know I'm paid. Mm -hmm. And I give you a prepaid voucher with your script back and you walk into my local lab and nothing, there can be no surprises, okay? You paid in advance, you agreed in advance, nobody's gonna call you up later and say we need to adjust your bill. We've all been through that, haven't we? You just did it, okay? And so, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of this. I have been doing it ever since I opened Fair Care for All. I've been doing a lot of this. I probably make 20% of my income off of selling lab at 10 cents on the dollar when it cost me 5 cents on the dollar. You know? And so, what are they doing in France? 
they're doing my prices for lab. We could, if we had an open market, what would happen to the cost of lab if everybody had to know, had to publish their prices? But you're not allowed, I'm not allowed to show you the name on this. It's just crazy. Yeah, I gotta do this one too. I thought my my I thought my sharpie worked better than it did. I'm gonna put my fingers in front of that. MRI, 325 bucks. They got three scanners around my area. They can get you in tomorrow. They have the best radiologists from all over the United States reading by telemetry. Uh, they have wonderful service. The only problem is what they do is. There are more MRI scanners in my town with 350,000 people than there are in all of Canada. That's how overpopulated we are. So these people come in, they say, oh, I want to get into the MRI market because there's a lot of profit. And then in a year later, they go bankrupt. Well, what this company does is they go, it costs a lot of money to buy an MRI. It costs a lot of money to tear it down. It costs a lot of money to move it. It costs a lot of money to reassemble it. Okay, and so they, and they usually have got a lease, and so what happens is when they go bankrupt, this company walks into the trustee for the bankruptcy and says, I'll offer you $200,000 for the balance on the lease, and they can do that, trustee can do anything they want, and the machine. And over the last 15 years, this company has bought the newest machine they can find that cost millions and millions of dollars, buys it for $200,000, and what's that 325 bucks? Labor. All the money's going to the radiologist and the tech. Now, remember, I told you, $343 for an MRI in Paris. Isn't that ironic? There's the American cash price. We need to go cash. What we know, I could fix all the health problems in America tomorrow with one three-word law in the U.S. Constitution. Insurance is illegal. No, we've got to make it four. Health insurance is illegal. We could probably talk about other insurance. It's all about a scammed up, but on health insurance sets the record for scam. You know, I, I always marvel. I, I remember 30, 40 years ago, I had a pretty nice house and farm out in the middle of Ohio, and my insurance company, I got my bill to insure the whole place, mm. and it was like $5,000 a year, and it's basically fire insurance. No, nothing else is going to happen to a brick house except fire, right? And it had a $250 deductible. And I said, what happens if I go to 1000 He said, oh, it drops 3000 I said, what happens if I go to 5000 He said, drops 500 And I said, so I save $4,500 a year for a $5,000 deductible. Do the math on that. And the rest of my life, I've always, everything I've ever done, I, I read a book years and years ago when I was a young physician, and it was Charles Given's Wealth Without Risk. Famous bestseller book, and that's what he taught. He said, highest deductible you can do. But then you can't cheat, you've got to make sure you Set have that, that money. Aside, you gotta yeah. have that money aside. Okay, all that deductible stuff, you can't get yourself caught or you get in trouble and you pour yourself down. Mm -hmm. And you got to save the money that you saved and put it in an account. And I've always done that. Ah, making yourself your own, self-insured. Self-insured. And that's what we should be. We should be, it should be unlawful to insure the first $10,000 of health care in America. Everybody ought to have to pay their own care. And people are going to say, well, what are you going to do about the poor? And I go, we can figure stuff out for that and give them subsidies. But... In 1974, in New York, they put a 25 cent copay on every prescription by law, and the rate at which prescriptions got filled dropped by 50 percent. Well, it wasn't because the people couldn't come up with a quarter. It, just had it was skin because it was free, and I have people all the time because I'm a missionary, and they call me up and they say, "Hey, Doc, Grandpa died, and I got this bag of meds." And I go, "Why do you have this bag of meds?" This is like more than a 90-day supply, and they say his attitude was he paid his premiums, he wanted them, he just never took them. Mm -hmm. We need to stop that. So the answer is go to cash.
go to cash. If you you know get the get the highest deductible health insurance premium that you can get, and self insure, and then don't try and use your insurance. Only keep it in case you get hit by a truck or like me, have your kidney out three years ago. Okay, but year after year after year after year, I was uninsured. Was I really uninsured? No, I had a ten thousand dollar deductible. Did I ever submit anything? No. Why would I? I never could even get close to spending ten thousand right. dollars. Okay. Now, the minute you get a year that you finally have that, you've got to keep all those records because you've got to go into that insurance management system and say, this is all of the things that I've done to eat up my $10,000 deductible and it was only $4,000 so that when they took my kidney out, I could go, I only owe six because I already spent four. Well, plain fact was I was on Medicare. I didn't pay anything. My entire out-of-pocket expenses for $160,000 worth of health care was $300. We can't afford Medicare. Medicare is completely bankrupt. Anybody who says Medicare for all is insane. They don't understand anything about it. They don't understand that it's all cost shifting and all the numbers are fake. And that's the, There's so many parts about this that are mind games that we get, we get uh, uh, dealt with just like we were puppets, marionettes, because uh, we get told, oh, it's a good thing to have universal coverage and we need everybody in the system and all that sort of stuff. What people don't realize is be careful what you ask for because what that means is you're going to be, because of all this corruption and because of all the hidden costs and the, and the no controls on increasing costs, in fact it's, it's the opposite, the, the system is built to feed on itself, yep. is that pretty soon you'll be working, you won't be able to retire and, and, when, and you'll be working more and more of your life going Giving it, we gave up a vacation last year so that I could pay for that expensive, overpriced medicine that was supposed to cost you know one tenth as much. So right. that kind of thing. Exactly. And our and our good our friend neighbor had to give up retirement and go back to work so he could right. afford. I his have COVID many payments. many people in my practice who are working only to pay their copays. I I remember I I had an old couple one time and they complained to me and they said Dr. Nielsen, our gastroenterologist has us on acid effects. And we're both spending two hundred dollars a month in copays to get our ass effects. And I said, I thought you liked Zantac. And she says, Oh, I do like Zantac. It's much better. And I said, Well, call my custom compounding pharmacist up, and I'll have him give you a price for a bottle of a thousand. And it was thirteen dollars. And they took that bottle all year for the two of them and spent six and a half bucks a piece on their Zantac, and it was better than their ass effects. And they were spending thirty-six hundred dollars a year just in copays. You know, but we're just sheep. We just keep going, oh, it's my health care system. I paid in. I'm on it. And I go, no, it's broken. Get out of the health care system and take the money you save, put it in the bank to get ready for your deductible, and go to every insurance agent you can and say, how do I get out of the system? I want the highest deductible I can get. The Democrats are trying to legislate that high deductible insurance policies are illegal. Oh, no. Yeah, they don't, they don't want those. Well, echoing what you were saying a little while ago about um, uh, the kickbacks, which is something I wrote down uh, when we passed that point, uh, we're going to be interviewing, we've mentioned it in passing before, but a good friend of ours who is a cancer survivor was pushed by her doc to, to submit to a chemotherapy regimen. And an alternate care doc, who I know uh, used to be a, a partner of yours, uh, a southern, in a town south of here, um, said, why don't you get this test first to see whether you're even a good candidate for it. The test cost a couple thousand, but it saved half a million dollars. Half a million dollars, because she was a terrible match for the and, drug. But even after that test result came back, the doc, the original cancer doc was still saying, yeah, but you better, you better do the chemo anyway, just, just, uh, just for peace of mind. I had, I had a terminal lung cancer patient who got $600,000 worth of chemo over two years that made him blue, bleed and bruise and had all kinds of problems and um, worked a little bit. And they said, well, I didn't work in it anymore, so we're going to go to the next drug, okay? And so he's all signed up for this next drug, and it's going to be another half a million bucks, and the side effects are absolutely brutal. And I asked the family, I said, have you looked into this drug? Because I looked into it, and I don't see that it's used in lung cancer effectively. I can't find any positive studies. Mm -hmm. So they went back to the guy, and they said, is this going to work? And he said, oh, it won't help you at all. And they said, why would you recommend it? And they said, because it gives you hope. 
Oh my. <laughs> Half a million dollars for fake hope. Well, as I walked in for my ten and a half thousand dollar treatment that should have cost me four hundred the copay should have been about fifty bucks, which is for a five hundred dollar treatment. I saw it and it was in it was in a cancer treatment suite. Well hematologists I, are oncologists. And You're I getting thought, treated by a cancer. I thought program. about all those other patients I saw around getting their getting their chemo and getting their other things and just thinking about all those tens of thousands of dollars all around the room just flowing out and flowing out of these people that we're, we're paying for it in our taxes, we're paying for it in our in our huge uh, premiums. And, and they, most of them, they cannot show that they work. We've talked about that when we talked about cancer. Most of these studies, you know, well, like I said, the French said that only 20% um, of, of any chemotherapy works 20% of the time. 80% of chemotherapy is less than 20% effective. I used to work with a um, good oncologist and she stayed good for one year and she used to tell people I want to ask you two questions okay and they're sitting there and she hasn't even opened up their chart yet and she says if you come in here with pancreatic cancer and I tell you that I can double your survival with the therapy do you want it and they said absolutely and I said let me show you the statistics on pancreatic cancer 96% of people with pancreatic cancer die no matter what you do, okay? 2% of people spontaneously recover and we don't know why, okay? 2% of the people, if I treat them, all of them, all 100, if I treat all 100, 2% turns into 4%. So I can double your survival from 2 to 4%. Do you still want it? No. Once they know what it's just a matter of understanding the numbers. And I tell people, go make them give you the numbers. Tell them, I am not going to do chemotherapy until you show me the three biggest studies that were ever done. And at the end of that, I'll take them back to Dr. Nielsen and have him read them with me at a visit. And I do this all the time. And I look at them and I go, this one worked 4%. And this one actually didn't work at all. And this one really did save quite a few lives. But quite a few people died from the therapy. And there were a lot of secondary cancers from the therapy later. But that's OK. I always tell people, cancer survivors don't get a whine. I'm a cancer survivor twice now. Okay, And one of those times, I had very traditional care, which gave me my second cancer. My first cancer when I was 31, the treatment gave me my second cancer when I was 65. Okay, And I don't complain about that because I'm supposed to be dead. And so I have all kinds of medical problems because of that thyroid cancer I had in 1981. Cancer survivors don't get a wine. I'm here. But I don't want to be screwed. I don't want to be lied to. And even the effective, even choosing a treatment isn't always an option. I've been told by a close acquaintance if it's a minor, if it's your child, the system may dictate to the parents you have to accept this particular course of treatment because that's the standard of care and if you don't you're being neglectful and uh, to your child and the state takes over so we can maybe get into that and if you know, validate that another time but, uh, but I, have a, I have a friend who had an 11 year old with Crohn's disease and he refused to give the drugs and wanted to do nutritional therapy and they went into court and took that child away from him until she was age of majority and she came back to the family and she never got over her Crohn's and within a year after that with non-pharmacologic medicine we made it all go away and today she doesn't have Crohn's and it's all cured okay but the child abuse system mm -hmm. removed her from her parents home because they had no right to provide care to their own child so you talked about the uh, conflict of interest and the corruption that exists in the in the medical uh, financial complex and how the companies own the companies that that are uh, they own the, the right hand and the left hand in both pockets as well yeah. and it's in collusion with the government regulators that are supposed to be overseeing this and now it's going to be where even the choice of care is going to be dictated to people we're losing so. the choices in our community we're going to a to a two two-party system and they're both agreeing on their prices we're down to a two-party system. We, we got a little bit of hope down uh, there with a near, hospital. Um, near monopoly, uh, oligopoly here in the in yeah. medical providers. It's a mass. Class. And we're doing that nationwide. We're, we're just becoming just four providers, just United Healthcare, Mad Mutual, you know. But in the end, it's Medicare. Medicare makes all the rules. 
Nobody has to pay a bill. If Medicare won't pay one penny for a procedure, they don't have to pay anything other. There's no secondaries allowed to pick it up. And so Medicare, if they want to say, we don't like that procedure, platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, okay, things that really cure people, they go, Medicare doesn't cover that, and now the secondary insurance doesn't have to cover it either. And they won't. And they won't. So be careful what you ask for, people, when you say Medicare for all. Yeah. may sound good. Not going to happen. Find out more. Not going to happen. Thank you again, Dr. Jay Nielsen, family doctor, for talking to us about the nightmare of medical costs and some hopeful steps people can do to take control of that for themselves and, and get out from underneath that monster. It's great to be here. Thank you, Donegan. Hey, HealingYourself.Life viewers. We need your help in enabling us to continue to create great health videos for you. So please support our mission by going to patreon.com slash healing yourself and pledging any monthly amount you can. Your pledge will also help us to afford a new Lyme peptide treatment therapy to improve our memory and we will report on our progress to benefit you and others. So remember, go to patreon.com slash healing yourself and pledge today. Were you going to tell them to go to patreon.com slash healing yourself to pledge to help our memory treatment? I thought I did. I'll do it. So please go to patreon.com slash healing yourself and pledge today. Thanks. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your first ounce of silver at spot price and free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com rp. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.